Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Days of Ire, Budapest 1956, and this game is really very, very cool. Um, you know, and really, I mean, to, to talk about it, I have to actually talk about the two different halves. One, it is a very, very interesting, asymmetrical, one versus all game, where one player is playing effectively a, a, a Twilight Struggle type experience, and the other players who work against him or her are playing a pandemic-style cooperative game. That right there is amazing. That is such a very, very cool uh, and innovative uh, gameplay setup. I'm really impressed by it. But then also, as an aside, I've also got to talk about how is this game as a pure co-op because up to three players or, or solo, one, two, or three players can work together against the AI. And, um, you know, and that is a game in and of itself. So, Let's talk about the co-op first, because in all honesty, that's why I had wanted to check this game out. Because my wife really doesn't have much patience for uh, game themes, game settings that uh, re that basically kind of recount the worst of human nature. And certainly, war and oppression and occupation, these are terrible, terrible things. And this week in 1956 was a terrible week. A lot of people died. And you know it was just a precursor to what came after, because even though the Hungarians won, and got the Soviets to leave in part because the you know I mean, the the local guy in charge really didn't want to fight. At least from what I've read of the history now, I mean you know he was actively um, petitioning for let's let's just pull out, let's not. I mean, but uh, basically after this event, uh, apparently it was a couple of weeks of ceasefire, but then the Soviets came back and they put the hammer down. So this game doesn't go cover the follow up that um, you know the occupation, but it just covers this one week and. For Jen, um, you know, while she appreciates it, you know, the historical significance of it, you know, the brave sacrifice that the resistance fighters led by the student movement, and but just you know, regular men and women, boys and girls, were literally rising up to throw off the shackles of oppression and all of that stuff. I, you know, it, while it's it's a it's a noble and worthy story to tell, it's not one that Jen particularly wants to experience. So I knew that she was not going to have any interest in playing the standard version, the you know the asymmetrical. Hey, I'll play the Soviets, she plays the resistance, because she just doesn't want to run around in the real world with real guns, killing real people. So um, what I was really interested in was the notion of well, maybe as a cooperative game, because you know it's not like she's not uh, interested in history and learning more about the reality. Maybe she would enjoy it as a cooperative game. So that's why I checked it out, and I'm going to talk about the cooperative game first. It's fun. It, this game, I would actually say, can kind of stand on its own. If you get this game solely for the cooperative experience, if you have an interest in the subject matter, it is a worthy game because every time you play, while the sweep of history is going to play out in roughly the same order, there is enough variety based on the cards you draw, base, and more importantly, this, this notion of these fighters. Because uh, for the resistance, your main resource is not the cards in your hand, like... Um, pandemic, although they're very, very important too. Your main resource is the fighters who you recruit to join you, all of whom have special skills that you can use at different times to turn the tide in your favor. You've got to keep them alive, I mean, because they will follow you and they will sacrifice themselves to save you, because if you die, it's game over. But you need to sacrifice yourself to keep them alive, because they're so absolutely crucial, managing them and making sure they're in the right place at the right time, that even though, like I said, you know, the basic, I mean, every time it's going to play, it's going to play out differently. You might have a game where you never see the radio as an example, or you might do that very, very early before a lot of events get on the board. It's going to play out differently with the different story beats, but largely the story is going to be historically accurate as all these particular moments move. What changes from game to game in the cooperative experience is the, all the, the access to what fighters you get, what cards come in your hand, and how you solve the problem, how you solve the puzzle based on what Zukov will do. And I just got to say, I very much enjoyed it. Um, although, unfortunately, Jen's distaste for the theme of actually putting a gun in her hand and killing people, whether they're oppressors or not, uh, prevented her from actually enjoying that with me either. So, I should say, I've played this game twice. Once as a solo game, me against the AI. That was a very, very satisfying game. I lost, but it felt pretty tight. I felt like, with repeated play, 
um, and some smart decisions. I could have won, and it was satisfying. And then plus, I you know played a little bit of a game right here, and uh, because I haven't gotten a chance to actually play it, so that's why it was actually kind of cool to kind of emulate how it would work with multiple players. Because when you play totally solo, you've just got one character, all the cards are in your hand. You can take five hit points of damage. You get four actions. You're a very powerful character, zipping all over the city, dealing with all these hot spots. But as soon as you split that up, and now you only have half the actions, and one of the actions is actually trading cards back and forth to make sure, right, give me that first aid. I'm going to head south over to Corbin's Passage to empty that out while you get yourself into position so you can strike the radio. You know, you can get those kinds of interesting one too. So the co-op game is great. But let's actually talk about the main event now, um, which I was lucky enough to play uh, with uh, David Chirkop, who is the publisher, not the designer, but the publisher of this game from Cloud Island Games. He lives here in Malta. So he actually brought this copy over, and he sat down with me, and we played the full game. Him as Soviets, me as Resistance. A full game all the way through. And I've got to say, because you know, unlike Jen, I don't really have a problem with heavier, darker themes like this. I mean, heck, I've made lots of shooters in my day, so I'm, I'm comfortable with taking on the role of a freedom fighter or an oppressive force. And so I got to play it with Dave, and I thought that was a really smart, well-designed game also. And it was interesting. In that game, I got to, you know, my big thing, if people watch my show, they know I'm really not a big fan of trying to attack other players. And the interesting thing is, if you're playing the Resistance, like I said, you're not really so much directly attacking the Soviet player. You are playing your pandemic cooperative game, running around trying to fight all these hotspots on the board. The Soviet player, which I just demoed for you in the main intro, they are playing this area control game where they're just trying to maintain control of the city and making smart decisions about how to deploy their forces to put down the resistance. So the Soviet player is playing a very aggressive, very in-your-face game where they are hunting the resistance, um, you know, trying to smartly play, balance, um, you know, creating good events for them, but they need those... Uh, CV points so they can get more stuff on the board because if they don't keep stuff on the board, they lose. There's a lot of interesting push and pull they've got to go through, but it's always with an eye towards putting this resistance down. The resistance fighters, they're just running around in the world that the Soviet player creates for them. And that is a very, very cool synergistic competitive game, where, um, which I absolutely love. It works so phenomenally well. And both sides are seem to be, with my limited experience, very well balanced. Um, they both have multiple paths to victory, depending on how you want to pursue it. And um, you know, in the, in the game I played with David, there were definitely moments where, I mean, you know, it looked like I was really down, but I built up a big hand of cards, and I was able in one turn to take out like three events all at once. And David's like, oh my god, how did you do that? And I'm like, because I'm smart, uh, because the game really gives you an interesting logistical problem to solve every step of the way, and it works. This is a very, very impressive game. So, for anybody who is interested in Twilight Struggle inspired gameplay, and you've seen lots of other games that do that, you know, including 1960 and, and 1989, I mean, there's a lot of games out there that do that. So, if you like the command point action system, this is something to check out. If you like cooperative, um, pandemic-style groups of players working against constantly spreading threat, this is a game worth checking out. If you are interested in, in the historical events of a week in October in 1956 that um, signaled a major, major turning point in the early days of the Cold War, that is maybe something that if you're not Hungarian, you don't learn much about. You might want to check this out because this is a very historically edifying. I, mean, I feel like I've learned a lot that I didn't know about just from having experienced this game. You might check this out. Um, if you're a fan of asymmetrical or one versus all, you might check this out. Um, if you just like really smart, solid, I mean, it's, I mean, what can I say bad about this game? Um, like I said, I think about the only real complaint anybody could levy about it is the concern that because it, of the way it's set up, that you know, I mean, you have early, mid, and late week cards that every time you play, broadly, the story beats are going to be kind of the same. They'll come in slightly different order. Sometimes one beat won't happen, and other times a beat will happen, but overall it tells the same story. But again, I can't even call, fault the game for that because within that same historic story, being told, and every time you play, you get a different shade of that story, a different variant of that story. Every time you play, 
The cards that come into your hand, the order that events become available to play, will create a unique puzzle to create if you're the Soviet player, or to solve if you're the resistance player. And I mean, I, I definitely think it holds up. Um, I'm really kind of bummed Jen has absolutely zero interest in the subject matter and is actively put off by the bloodshed of this game. And that's something you got to bear in mind too. I mean, you might be put off by the subject matter. So, I mean, that would be, I think, about the only reason I can think of not to check this game out because. Um, you know, and that's the thing too. I was nervous about this going in because I don't want to play a game where all my thought is bent on trying to destroy you. In that game, it just plays the resistance. You're not actually trying to destroy the, um, the Soviet player and undo everything they're trying to do. You're just trying to survive and save your city. It's it's just so clever. My hat's off to the design team of David Turtsey, uh, Catelyn Number Fourth, and uh, uh, Molly uh, Vincenzi. They have done a phenomenal job. Like I said, it's on Kickstarter right now. You can check out the link to find out more. Bear in mind, I didn't say right up front, everything I've got here is prototype. The real game isn't going to have paper-thin standees and all that. Oh, man. It's just really great. Heck, I didn't even show you everything. Late in the game, the Resistance have the chance to get their own tanks. I did do barricades. As more of these events pop out, that can fundamentally change things. The more you play this game and the more you are familiar with the history, and you can think, you know what? There's a chance late in the game this particular event's going to happen because I've made that happen. I can start planning for that. I mean, I, I think the game definitely has legs. And... Um, yeah, if Jen were more interested. I mean, or, I mean, if, I, I forgot to mention, if you're just looking for a great solo game, it's a really good solo game, too. I love the fact that, unlike so many co op games, if you want to play this solo, hey, you only have to control one character. They've balanced and they've adjusted everything, so it still works. Mwah. Days of Ire, Budapest 1956. And also, you may notice, Days of Ire, Budapest 1956, implies that Days of Ire is a pretty general purpose system. And I could certainly see this being applied to all sorts of other historical situations, both modern day and, you know, old world, ancient world stuff. So, I think this has, you know, this entire game system has huge potential to continue to be expanded and exploited. Um, provided it's successful. So again, check out that Kickstarter page if you want to learn more. And that's it, folks. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, as always, let me know. Apologies for any mistakes I made. I, I might have made a few more mistakes here than I normally do because um, you know, there's a lot in this game, and uh, I didn't have player aids yet, so I, I might have made a few goofs here and there, but hopefully in spite of those, which you can find out the goofs by checking the show notes or watching with annotations turn on, in spite of whatever goofs I made, you have a pretty good idea of what this game feels like to play, both as a competitive game and a cooperative game. And that's it, folks. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.